When it comes to leaders specifically, um, the starting point is we're expected to be strong. And in fact, by and large, we got to where we are because we are strong. And, and that, that includes all aspects of, of strength, physical, um, mental, mental, mental and emotional. Uh, but those aren't, th that, that strength is one characteristic. It may not be the most important one. Good afternoon, Gerard and Catherine. Hello to everyone out there in the Ivy community and beyond. I'm Mark Healy. I'm the Executive Director of the Ivy Academy, the Learning and Development Wing of Ivy Business School in London. You know, we, we've talked about a lot about this lately. There isn't a lot as business school we can do to help directly right now. We're not in the thick of it on the front lines alongside our friends in healthcare. We've heard from three of them last week, and we so appreciate their efforts and sacrifices. But we do hope we can help a little by calling on some of our friends with informed points of view and some lessons to share. Gerard, this is the fourth of these interviews we're doing on leadership in these strange and uncertain times. We've spoken with some folks who were good enough to give us their time, share views on the current crisis and what good leadership life looks like. Something you know we don't talk a lot about uh, is our kind of our own purpose. Why does the academy exist? We exist because the world needs better leaders and Canada needs better leaders. I know Gerard would vehemently agree with that. And today we're really fortunate to be joined by a great citizen and a great leader in Canada, that's Dr. Catherine Zahn. Dr. Zahn was appointed the president and CEO of the, for the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, that's Ken H, in Toronto in 2009. She received her MD honors from Faculty of Medicine at U of T, where she completed her residency in neurology. She holds an MSc in Health Administration from U of T, has completed the Director's Education Program at Rahman as well. Dr. Zahn is a champion for the integration of psychiatry and neuroscience, working to steer mental illness into the mainstream of medicine and promoting equitable access to healthcare resources for people with mental health. She's leading CAMH through a major expansion and renewal phase and has attracted Canada's leading philanthropic support for research in mental illness and addiction. I want to talk a little bit about Gerard as well. Gerard Seitz is the executive director of the ENO Yanitowicz Institute for Leadership and holds the same. Uh, chair and same name at Ivy. He's one of our leadership gurus. If you know Gerard, you'll know he's nothing if not passionate about what he does. And he did, he does like to wave his arms and hands around a lot. So this webinar thing's a bit tough for him. But uh, Gerard, I'm sure you'll manage it. Over to you. Good afternoon, Catherine. It's uh, it's nice to see you. Although uh, you know we had hoped that uh, there would be uh, better circumstances. One of the things that Mark uh, didn't tell you about Catherine is that she's a former member of the Leader Council at the ENO in the Coach Institute for Leadership, and quite frankly, very instrumental in uh, helping us to develop a, um, a strategic plan. So Catherine, good to see you, and uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, spend some time with us this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, before I ask you uh, a series of questions, I'd like to uh, find out first, how are you doing and how's your family doing during these very trying times? Thanks, Gerard. Do you know what? It's really nice to reconnect. So I'm uh, most happy to be here with you and happy to do this. Uh, and I would say that at this point in time, both uh, uh, myself and my entire family are, uh, are, are safe and well. Uh, I have to say, uh, I didn't think that I would have to deal with two uh, major infectious disease crises in my professional lifetime. Uh, and, uh, uh, and there's a big difference between now and SARS in 2003, both from the point of view of my experience and my leadership and also the situation. Back then, uh, I was uh, providing care as a physician. I was leading uh, a uh, um, physician department, and I was uh, also in an administrative role, leading one of the UHN hospitals. And uh, I would have to say this is this is quite different. Um, it is certainly more intense, and the light at the end of the tunnel has still not appeared. But also, there is um, this new sense of of uh, the whole community being involved. So that has positives, but mainly negatives. In in as much as life as we knew it during SARS outside of the hospitals went on. And uh, now we're facing uh, a lot of burdens that are separate. So let me ask a follow-up question on that, uh, Catherine. Of course, you're the president and CEO of the Center for Addiction and, and Mental Health. Uh, for those of us who uh, not fully understanding as to uh, what, the, what the center is doing on, on a normal day, in a regular day, uh, what would have been uh, your responsibilities and uh, how specifically has that uh, shifted uh, these days? What what really keeps you and your colleagues uh, busy at the center? 
Well, well, overall, CAMH is a, a large uh, academic health science center that's dedicated to, to mental health. Uh, not uh, not everybody understands this, but we have 500 uh, inpatient beds uh, and programs that span the spectrum of, of life from childhood to uh, uh, to uh, seniors and and um, uh, all aspects of uh, psychiatry uh, diagnosis, as you know them, but also neurodevelopmental disorders and neurodegenerative diseases. We see literally hundreds of thousands of ambulatory visits per year, and uh, our emergency now sees about 13,000 uh, 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 individuals per year. Uh, the the important I made at the beginning when I talk about CAMH being an academic health science center um, is important to me because it it signals that uh, our duty, our duty of care, is not just to the people we're serving today. Those that are in our arms now, they're uh, they're about uh, uh, today and tomorrow, and we enact that duty through our research and our innovation, but also about individuals locally and globally, and we address that through our our uh, education and our knowledge transfer initiatives. So there, the the thing that I think when we talk about leadership before and after, uh, there are some things that are very much the same. They just take uh, different uh, different levels of priority, uh, and I'm not sure that everybody uh, um, uh, articulates or or, uh, or thinks explicitly about the fact that positions such as mine, such as yours, have two components. One is a leadership, and one is a management component. And and the leadership uh, um, component for me, I try to enact it in the same way that I always do, and uh, I have uh, I have a. Um, uh, 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 a trio of O's that I, I talk about in the organization, and they become even more important now than they ever were. And I talk about CAMH as, as being uh, an organization that's filled with optimism, uh, a place of opportunity, and, and, a, and a place of oneness of, uh, of, of, of purpose. Um, so, so that continues, and uh, and I would venture to say that uh, that in these situations, from a leadership point of view, your strategy shouldn't really change. It's your it's your tactics that change, uh, but if you're true to your principles and your uh, and your values, things uh, things things go forward in a in a at least a, a semi-rational sense. On the management level, again, it's always about uh, guarding garnering resources. And it's about keeping your people safe so that they're safe and healthy to take care of uh, of um, of uh, your your patients uh, and actually to carry out the business of the organization. Those observations or the things that you shared with us, things around uh, optimism, safety, uh, health. And so, like many Canadians uh, these days, I read these, uh, these surveys in the, in the media. And uh, a recent one indicated that more than half of Canadians are finding that the pandemic has a negative impact on their mental health. Uh, personally, I find that an outstandingly uh, high number, shocking actually. And so what do you make of this? What general advice would you have for Canadians? Well, I have a, there's a whole spectrum of things to think about here. And it's, I think, important not to just simply take that at face value. Because uh, uh, I would say, even in the 10 years that I've been in this, this position, there's so much more awareness of the importance of mental health. And in fact, we've we've built our brand on the idea that mental health is health, that it's the, at, the, at, at the core of the center of health. So 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 people are are more free to talk about it. Uh, the public has been given language to talk about it and to feel uh, feel good about it. Uh, but the caution that I have been trying to give to people is that when you're in situations like this, it's actually quite normal to be fearful. It's normal to be anxious and normal to uh, uh, have uh, some consternation over the unsettled nature of, uh, of, of the world right now. And uh, I give I give um, the same advice and I've given this advice like literally dozens of times over the over the past month uh, on on the personal level. It's so important to attend to your health uh, in, in all aspects, uh, not just your mental health or your emotional health, but your to, but to keep um, your exercise up, to get out and to get a little fresh air where it's safe and to uh, try to rest. And then, and then on the second level, we're human beings and it's important to as much as possible in in when in a situation that's very um, alienating and disoriented to make sure that you 
capitalize on your your interpersonal relationships, your family relationships, your friends, and and, and at work, and find ways to continue to connect. But uh, but for individuals either with pre-existing um, uh, diagnoses of mental illness who live with mental illness, or people who have have uh, new symptoms that uh, that are so distressing that they're not able to function, that uh, they've lost all the joy in their life, that uh, they feel paralyzed, that they feel that they wish they could be sad because they feel so empty. People who have uh, thoughts of self-harm, those are those are reasons to uh, to seek help and seek help urgently. And uh, uh, there are many ways to do that. In in your environment, the place to start is with the student uh, the student health uh, services. But uh, but there are are many um, uh, websites, including our own camh.ca, that actually have. Uh, have uh, resources for the public and uh, and roadmaps for getting help. So you talk about the students. Yeah, many questions. So let me ask a student related question. Um, you know, one of the questions that, that that came our direction is is how for students. You know, what are ways to normalize their feelings? I mean, obviously, there's feelings of uh, of anxiety. Uh, there's feelings that are related to uh, to grief. Uh, maybe because of, of illness in, the, in a direct family, but also things like, uh, you know, no convocation, um, you know, the entire kind of social networks, the daily connections have gone, and so uh, and so forth. So um, students are trying to make sense of, uh, of, of, of how they're feeling. Uh, some of them actually might be afraid of, of those feelings that they have and have difficulty talking about those feelings. What would your advice be for students to normalize those feelings and find ways to articulate those feelings and, and, and talk to them and talk to those feelings about uh, with, with other individuals? So I have to start by reminding people I'm not a mental health professional myself, although I have a lot of familiarity. So uh, so I just take all of this with uh, uh, a uh, little little bit of a of a grain of salt. But to uh, I think it's important to uh, to to appreciate the level of intensity and the layers of, of, uh, of, uh, of pressure that uh, exist right now. You've already mentioned the issue of actually the disease itself, the fear of becoming ill or an, a loved one becoming uh, coming ill. Then there's the pressure of the public health uh, measures that have been put into place, this intense separation from, uh, uh, from, from other human beings. And for students, uh, I, I, I really myself find it hard to imagine uh, what this, what they're, what, what you're all thinking when it comes to the impact of the economic downturn? What implications does that have uh, uh, for your future? So, so I can't stress enough that it's that if you're feeling anxious, you're totally normal, and uh, and 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 the um, the things that I mentioned before about how to uh, take care of yourself and, and connect all all pertain. But I think. It's uh, it's just just to give you uh, a, a little bit of a story. Uh, I, I I think many of us and many of us who are in situations where we're achieving higher education and have uh, have aspirations have have at least some little seed of feeling of uh, invincibility or invulnerability, and uh, it is it is hugely hard to reach out. So I I I explain to people that I was once like that. And uh, years ago, I was faced with a, a pretty significant tragedy in my life. And for the first time, I felt I couldn't do it myself. And I did reach out to family. I did reach out to friends. And um, all I can say is that, number one, nothing bad happened. Nobody judged me for it. People understand. And I was shocked to understand how important it is for you to actually give those people the opportunity to help. Because one of the things we do know psychologically is that helping others is one of the best ways to get through something like this. So uh, so if you can do it yourself and give others the opportunity to help you, uh, take take that opportunity, maintain your, uh, uh, your con connections, uh, uh, because you, you are creating opportunities to uh, develop uh, multi-pronged and interactive support uh, systems. Another group, of course, is uh, those people at the front lines, uh, whether this be the public, the private, and the not-for-profit sector. Um, I think it's not unreasonable to articulate that those people got actually way more than they bargained for. This is truly an unprecedented uh, event. 
many of us would say we're now four, five, six weeks into this uh, event. And I can imagine that for some people, they may fall victim to fatigue, anxiety, depression, frustration. Many people, many leaders might feel overwhelmed. What advice would you have for those individuals? Because, uh, you know, we're talking a little bit that uh, there could be light at the end of the tunnel, but that tunnel is still pretty long. Uh, so what can they do in between to make sure that they themselves stay uh, healthy and uh, okay? So so I, mean, I I have a whole lot to say about that, but, uh, but when you talked about light at the end of the tunnel, I want to uh, relate a, a video that someone sent me. There, there are... Um, uh, numerous train trips that you can watch from the point of view of a uh, of uh, the conductor in in or the driver in a train, and one of them is a nine hour trip in uh, to the Arctic Circle in Norway, and it goes in and out of of uh, multiple tunnels, and uh, and it's uh, it's it's stunning to watch it, uh, and you can fast forward it of course, but uh, in the points when you're in the tunnels, you long for that speck of light. You long for it, so uh, so I, I I I understand that feeling, and if you want a visual of how it feels, uh, I I highly recommend that. But um, but back to your specifically to your question, uh, I I think this the pandemic of course has been predicted for a long time, and but at the same time, I don't um, know that we could have ever been totally prepared for this. And uh, I want to uh, I want to say up front that I'm very very proud to be a Canadian. I'm very uh, very proud of the Canadian response, the Ontario response, the, the health health sector response, but also the response of the citizens, the responsibility that they're taking for their own health. And and uh, in the protection of their of their neighbors. When it comes to leaders specifically, um, the starting point is we're expected to be strong. And in fact, by and large, we got to where we are because we are strong. And, and that, that includes all aspects of, of strength, physical, um, mental, 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 and emotional. Uh, but those aren't, th that, that strength is one characteristic. It may not be the most important one. And so uh, the the leaders that uh, that I admire and try to emulate, and the, the advice I give to uh, future leaders is is um, this constellation of things that are are so critical in times like this are first of all uh, a, a very high level of self self knowledge, uh, and by that I mean both um, self awareness, uh, understanding what you're made of and what you can do and what you can't do, but also also self control, uh, being, being able to uh, control your emotions and your, and your mood when, when you need to. And then, and then the, the second one is, is um, the communication one, to be able to not just talk, not just be glib, but to listen and to really hear what people's fears are. And when they say things that on the surface of them seem not fearful, to try to understand there's usually something beneath that. And last but not least, it's, um, uh, it's so important to be curious and uh, creative. As a, as a leader, because that's uh, bringing that to bear is how how we'll get out of out of this. So 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 the advice, the the, the recommendations uh, I give people, uh, uh, I'll say it again: stay healthy, stay healthy as you can. But um, but I'm going to bring two uh, two of my uh, rural upbringing um, uh, concepts to bear here. Uh, you have to understand what you can control and what you can't control. And farmers have a really intense understanding of the fact that the world turns. And sometimes the crops fail and sometimes they do too well and the prices go down. So you, so you have to, you have to uh, let go of the things that you can't control. And the second concept is there is so much noise. There is so much uh, uh, language in the atmosphere right now. You have to really um, uh, concentrate on, again, in the, in the rural uh, metaphor is hosing down the dirt clouds trying to understand what the real issues are and not all of the noise around you. And that's where I think it's so important to go back to that idea of, of an organization's strategy, your, your values and the principles upon which you make decisions and continue to articulate them over and over. Absolutely, the tactics changed. We went uh, in about... Uh, I don't know, about uh, three days to doubling the uh, number of virtual visits, we have now increased them by an order of magnitude. Oh, you know, and, and I can give you a long list of the things that we've uh, been able to, to, to quickly change. But again, you get, 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 get an understanding of what you're, what you're supposed to be doing and then 
uh, change the tactics around how how to do them best. And um, if you think this is an old aphorism, uh, uh, Gerard, that I'm sure you're familiar with, if you, if you think you've communicated enough, do it again 10 times. Catherine, earlier you talked about one of the three O's of CAMH, and that uh, there was optimism. Uh, how can we find optimism in these uh, in these very uh, challenging situations? I I find it all around me. I I I, I see uh, I, I see our staff. I mean, see the staff who uh, uh, have uh, uh, come to terms with the uh, uh, with the fear. Understand that. Uh, uh, that that we're caregivers by nature, and that's uh, that's that's the work that we do. Uh, the the uh, um, the the faith and the trust that you need to engender, so people can uh, remain optimistic. That uh, uh, that that the safety of our staff and our patients is is, is first and foremost. That we uh, are not going to abandon our academic uh, mission because of uh, uh, because of this. And uh, and and you know we're going to be. Uh, we're going to be in this situation uh, for for some time, uh, which brings up its own challenges. This is this is maybe a little bit tangential, but it's one of the things that I've been that I thought about during SARS, and it's and it's um, even more intense now. Um, CAMH is an organization that's used to a collaborative, consultative, uh, iterative type of uh, uh, leadership role. It's a talkative organization, and overnight we are. Um, activated our pandemic plan. We have an incident command center and we're essentially in a command and control environment. And that takes a little bit of uh, organizing and getting used to, and then you get into the rhythm of it. And um, shockingly, at the end, you start to like it. And it becomes, uh, uh, it, it becomes an intriguing problem to imagine how to get out of it. So how do you go back to uh, uh, to have to, uh, to engaging people in their creativity and uh, uh, in their uh, in their innovative natures. So so this is sort of addresses the uh, the issue that, that that you asked about maintaining the optimism is starting to talk early about things as simple as what are some of the things that we stopped doing because of this and we'll never go back to. What are the things that we put in place that are so good? How can we expand them? And and uh, you know people. People want to hear you uh, communicate the truth, and they want to understand that there is a purpose in uh, the the hard things that they have to do right now, and that purpose is uh, to, um, uh, to to save lives, to make a to, to make a better world. But they also need to know that as a as a leader, you get it. You know, you understand, and you're and you're with them, and that uh, uh, that you empathize with their um, uh, with their 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 challenges right now, and be and be walking along with them. No, I think that's terrific advice. Uh, thank you. Uh, another student-related question. <clears throat> uh, our MBA program, like uh, like many other MBA programs across the globe, has uh, quickly shifted to kind of an online uh, or remote instruction uh, program. Um, now, many students feel like uh, this is uh, yeah, actually they started two weeks in, in in the classroom, and then everything had to had to shift. And so many of them will tell you today that they feel that they miss out on a social interaction and a social connection. And, and for many of the students, that is a real loss. And so do you have any advice on how to establish, how to obtain and maintain a sense of community in a virtual space? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you have to be, you want to be purposeful about it. So that's, uh, uh, that's, that's the first point. And um, uh, I, you, you, I think it's important to do those extra activities that humanize it. And what I'm noticing lately is that when there is a, a manageable group in these virtual spaces, uh, uh, there's time given at the beginning to uh, inquire uh, about something um, massive or trivial in, uh, in, the, uh, in the world of the individuals that are on the screen. Uh, and don't... Um, uh, don't dehumanize it, or uh, actually, the, it's better to think of as, as humanize it as much as possible. So uh, honestly, there's nothing more delightful to see a, a, a kid running behind you in a, or, or one of the, 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 the participants or an animal uh, barking in the background, the doorbell ringing. Those, those all uh, signal the humanity of, 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 of the individuals and, and take us 
they make us not be talking heads. And so, so it, it, uh, um, another another tactic that I've seen that's really uh, very sweet is is be, bring food, bring food and eat in front of people. That's uh, uh, that 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 makes us uh, very very clearly uh, more more human human. And a re this the last thing is just a very practical one. Um, I think I. I Many are, are commenting on this, the fact that we book these meetings on the hour uh, and we don't leave a gap in between. So uh, we're so myself, I don't have to stand up even and walk down the hall to my next meeting or around the corner or to another floor. I can just sit here uh, all day long, which is horrifying. So 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 think of that when you're uh, when, when you're booking these meetings. It's um, it's. Uh, uh, it, it's it is it it's the world we live in right now. But I do think that that some of the little things that we can do uh, uh, make a difference. I tell I, I tell myself, you know, dress up, be respectful of the people that, that are on the other side. Uh, I, I haven't seen anybody coming in in pajamas and robes, but uh, uh, it it is important to show respect for the for the people that you're talking to. Absolutely, uh, Catherine. The uh, final few minutes that we uh, that we have left. Uh, what is uh, a main message you would like to uh, leave with uh, with people that are watching the recording? Uh, could be students, could be leaders from the public, private, from the not for uh, not for profit sector. Could be young, could be the elderly. Is there anything else you would like to share when it comes to uh, to health and mental health in uh, in particular, and things that uh, you and I on a daily basis uh, can do to uh, to stay fit and stay healthy? I'm, I'm going to say two. I'm going to give give you two things, and they're they're more personal than than uh, than not. And one of them circles back to our earlier conversation about what it what it means to be a leader, and um, the 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 um, the burdens and the and the the importance of of um, of looking for your own supports and not looking to your staff to support you. You need to be the strong one. And, um, and I have this, this, um, I, I actually can't remember where I came across this, this concept. Sorry for my uh, background code blue. Um, but the, the aphorism is that, um, that a shared sorrow or anxiety or, uh, or grief or fear draws people closer. Uh, and I, I, I think that that may be the case if all of the people involved are equals. But uh, when those that share the grief are at different levels of power or there's a big gap in, in age, um, the sight of, of misery or angst in, um, in the more powerful person or, or, or the leader can be paralyzing and alienating. Uh, to, to, to your constituents. So, so what I what I think is really important for leaders to consider is is what are your resources? What what are your personal resources? But also your own, your colleagues, your 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 family, where you can draw strength from. So um, so you don't lay your burden on the people that you report to. And then the the the, la the last thing I would say is that um, uh, one way or another, we're going to find our way out of this. And I just will share with you that um, in a recent town hall I had with the staff, I, uh, I um, answered this question by paraphrasing uh, Tina Turner. Uh, and you, you may not all be fans of the Mad Max movie, but I am. And you remember her, her theme song from the Mad Max Thunderdome uh, was, we don't need another hero. We are just people. We are just human beings. We, we, uh, we do not have to be heroes. We just need to be sturdy and uh, and, and ourselves. Uh, so if you remember the tune is we don't we don't need another hero. Uh, and at this moment in time, we actually don't even know need to know the way home. We just need to know that that uh, that we can walk together uh, forward forward until uh, 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 until um, we're we're. Uh, I think the, the line is something like being out of town, out of the Thunderdome. So, so uh, we will get through this, uh, and, and it is important to, uh, um, to, to appreciate that on some level we have to roll, roll with it and do what we have to do and put one foot right in front of the other. You may not know it, uh, Catherine, but uh, I get very emotional when you talk about this. So don't, don't know why. Thank you. Uh, thank you for <laughs> the time that you, uh, that you spent with us. Uh, thank you for your uh, great advice. And I think I speak on behalf of many, many people that say that would like to thank you for all the incredible art and important work that you do. So uh, thank you. Uh, be well, stay well to you and, uh, and all your colleagues. And uh, back to Mark. Mark, over to you. Thank you.
Yeah, I, I wanted to, I wanted to say uh, thank you very much because my team made fun of me yesterday for eating a sandwich in front of all of them on Zoom, and so now, now I'm going to come back and say, well, the world's the Canada's leading uh, expert in mental health, so that's actually <laughs> a good thing. So, uh, so there you go. Th thank you for making time. I know, I know you're incredibly busy right now, and we still appreciate it. Everyone in the community uh, appreciates your time. Thank you to you, and thanks, Jar, for doing all the best. Take care. Cheers. Bye.